This presentation will talk about oral health care in persons with dementia. It was originally prepared by Dr. Jane Chalmers in Memoriam in 2005. It was reviewed and updated by Dr. Leo Marchini, Department of Preventive and Community Dentistry, the University of Iowa College of Dentistry and Dental Clinics in 2017. This presentation will encompass three topics. The importance of oral health for people with dementia, evidence-based research concerning the onset and progression of oral diseases in people with dementia, and the preventive oral health care triad. It is really important for everyone involved with caring for people with dementia to understand why maintaining good oral health is essential. As dementia progresses, many patients' ability to perform their own oral hygiene care will significantly decrease. They will also lose the ability to communicate dental pain and other problems to other people. People with dementia face more barriers to accessing dental care. They have specific needs regarding transportation, their finances may be tight, and they have trouble communicating their oral health related problems. There is also a decrease in patients and caregivers' recognition of the significance and consequences of dental pain, as well as a reduced perception of the need for dental treatment. In addition, there is an increase in the use of medications for behavior management, many of which lead to dry mouth. As a result, there is a lot of neglect of oral hygiene care and dental treatment in addition to ignorance about people with dementia developing dental problems and pain, including those caused or worsened by the adverse oral side effects of many of the medications they use on a daily basis. Furthermore, interactions and communication with dental and health professionals become more difficult as dementia progresses. Many times, the cumulative effect of oral health neglect ends up causing an increased need for expensive and high-risk procedures under sedation or general anesthesia. Neglected oral health problems can also contribute to nutritional, behavioral, and medical problems. Consequently, neglected oral health can have a negative impact on the quality of life for people with dementia. To maintain their oral health-related quality of life, Older adults with dementia should be able to eat and talk comfortably, feel happy with their appearance, stay pain-free, maintain self-esteem, and maintain oral hygiene care habits and dental care standards. Many patients in care facilities complain that as they start to depend on caregivers for their oral hygiene routines, these routines have changed dramatically, many times being inappropriately performed. It doesn't need to be like that. Many behavior problems in dementia may be related to dental problems. Some of the behavior problems that may be related to dental issues are disinterest in food and not eating, pulling at the face or mouth, chewing of the lip, tongue, or hands, grinding of teeth or dentures, not wearing dentures, verbal and physical aggression during activities of daily living, or ADLs, and alterations in activity, for example, tiring, somnolence, screaming, and restlessness. By improving oral health, behavior can improve dramatically. Other important reasons to improve oral health for people with dementia are related to their systemic health. It is very important to maintain adequate nutrition and hydration, and having a pain-free mouth may help improve dietary choices. Many times, the dentist can work alongside other healthcare team members, notably speech therapists and nutritionists, to help patients eat better. The dentist can also identify possible oral side effects of medications, which may have a detrimental effect on the patient's oral health. One of the most common oral side effects of medications taken by people with dementia is dry mouth. Dry mouth drastically increases the risk for oral health problems. There can also be speech problems and swallowing problems related to medications. Tardive dyskinesia is associated with patients taking antipsychotic medications for a long period of time, even if they are not taking it any longer, 
and it shows as an oral movement disorder. Gingival growth is another important side effect of some medications, such as anti-epileptic drugs and calcium channel blockers. It leads to abnormal growth of the gingival tissue and local bleeding and pain. Another problem related to medications is their interaction with dental treatments. For example, some oral antifungals used intraorally to treat fungal infections can interact with warfarin. We should also be aware of possible interactions among multiple medications and local anesthetics, sedation, and general anesthesia. People that are not compliant with their blood pressure or diabetes medication can also experience problems related to complicated dental extractions. Medication history and duration of use is very important on assessing tardive dyskinesia, as we talked about earlier. The level of pain medication that patients are on can also influence the assessment and treatment of oral pain. This table presents antipsychotics as an example of medication oral side effects and how those effects may differ within a class of drugs. For example, paracyazine, a more traditional antipsychotic, presents with the highest anticholinergic effects and has been shown to be related with worse oral health outcomes. Haloperidol, on the other hand, has one of the lowest anticholinergic side effects, but is highly correlated with tardive dyskinesia. More modern medications have presented with reduced side effects, but they can still occur, so be sure to look for them. Oral health care can also help to minimize and manage consequences of comorbid medical conditions, such as Sjogren's syndrome, arthritis, strokes, radiation, and chemotherapy. Additionally, oral health care can also help to prevent comorbid medical problems, for example, bacteremias or aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia is a leading cause of death among nursing home residents. Poor oral hygiene, care of teeth and dentures, can lead to the emergence of anaerobic periodontal organisms from plaque or the colonization of enteric organisms in the oral flora after seven days. These organisms and aspirated saliva can result in pneumonia. The risk is higher for those who are bedridden, dependent for feeding, intubated, on ventilators, are known aspirators, have recently used antibiotics, or have low salivary flow, swallowing disorders, active periodontal disease, or poor oral hygiene. So, what is the actual research evidence concerning the onset and progression of oral diseases in people with dementia? A recent systematic review by Foley and co-authors has confirmed that the oral health status of people with mild to severe dementia both in the community and at residential care facilities, was found to be poor across a broad range of dental assessments. Longitudinal studies have shown that current older adult populations are very different from previous cohorts as they are retaining their natural teeth for longer. It is now common to see people in their 90s with most of their natural teeth due to falling edentialism rates. As a consequence, there is a need for developing specific skills to deliver proper oral health care routines for dentate people instead of simply cleaning complete dentures. It is important to remember that, at any one time, not all older adults are at increased risk for oral diseases. When they are functioning independently in the community, they are not at higher risk. However, as they age and become more frail and functionally dependent, there is a higher chance that they will be at greater risk for at least one oral disease. The higher risk is in the years preceding institutionalization, when they become more physically or cognitively impaired and oral hygiene starts to be neglected. Many times, people are admitted to nursing facilities with an already compromised oral health status. There is a need to investigate it at admission so they can receive proper care. The subgroups of older adults at high risk for developing oral diseases include those with neurological and psychiatric conditions like dementia, motor neuron diseases, Parkinson's disease, and schizophrenia. Other at-risk groups include people presenting with medical conditions such as uncontrolled diabetes, 
head and neck irradiation, immunosuppression, and Sjogren's syndrome. Another at-risk group is people with higher functional dependence, whether living in the community or in a nursing facility. Persons with dementia will usually decrease their usage of dentures over time. This is due to the decline of orofacial neuromuscular control. They are not able to use their tongues, lips, and cheeks muscles to keep their dentures in anymore. Furthermore, denture use is also negatively affected by dry mouth, as it reduces denture retention and increases denture discomfort, and tardive dyskinesia, as the involuntary movements reduce denture stability. It is also important to be aware of denture-related lesions, such as denture stomatitis, inflammation and redness in the mouth areas covered by the dentures, as seen in the picture, angular chylitis, a mixed fungal and bacterial infection in the corner of the mouth, and hyperplasia, a growth of soft tissues under the dentures. Denture plaque accumulation must be avoided, as high levels of plaque accumulation on teeth or dentures increase the risk for aspiration pneumonia. Higher levels of plaque accumulation occur with increasing dependence on caregivers, especially for those who are living in facilities. Most older patients will not present with severe periodontitis like that seen in the picture. Only about 15% of the older adult population will develop severe periodontitis, gum disease with bone loss. However, a significant proportion of older patients will present with gingivitis, bleeding of the gums, and mild to moderate periodontitis. This is the main problem we have with oral health in people with dementia. A very high level of caries, tooth decay, which can affect both the crown and root surfaces of the tooth. The graph in this slide reinforces the higher level of new caries increments for both coronal and root surfaces, which occur for community dwelling people with dementia, the yellow bars, and nursing home residents, the white bars when compared to community-dwelling people without dementia, the blue bars. The graph in this slide reinforces that both coronal and root surfaces are more susceptible to caries among people with dementia. This is shown by the green bars for coronal caries among people with dementia and the light purple bars for root caries among the same group. People without dementia show much lower rates of new increments as illustrated by the blue bars, which represent coronal caries for people without dementia, and the gray bars, representing root caries for the same group. The graph in this slide shows that caries are not related to the type of dementia, for example, Alzheimer's disease, but rather to the severity of dementia. Although it was previously thought that caries would happen in the moderate stages of dementia, we now know it happens in the early stages of dementia, as oral health care is one of the first activities that becomes impaired. This table shows how high the caries rates are when looking to the distribution of two-year caries-adjusted surface increments. For the patients with dementia, it can be seen that no coronal increments, those presenting with no new decay on the crowns of their teeth, is only about 17% and those presenting with five or more increments is about 53%, as compared to 38.5% and 12% respectively among the controls. For root caries, those with dementia presenting with five or more increments were about 30%, and those without dementia were only about 6%. As many times decay evolves without proper treatment among persons with dementia, it is common to see these people presenting with severely broken down teeth, which usually carry infection to the surrounding bone. Those remaining root tips usually need to be removed, which many times ends up happening under sedation or general anesthesia, with high costs and high risks for the patient. Thus, it is much better to prevent decay from developing to this level of tooth deterioration. A very dramatic problem is that older adults with dementia also present with decreased dental treatment provision. As a consequence, they usually have gone long periods without seeing a dentist. Neither preventive care nor fillings have been provided, 
and caries develop until the teeth are broken down to root tips, as we have seen previously and as you can see in the picture. During this process, oral infection, pain, and discomfort are also happening unnoticed. What can be done to prevent oral health deterioration from happening? Establish a preventive oral health care routine, which should include frequent oral health assessments, appropriate daily oral hygiene care, and dental treatment provision. When considering the delivery of preventive oral health care, keep in mind the factors presented in the diagram, the risk factors involved for developing oral diseases and conditions, as systemic health problems, polypharmacy, and severity of the dementia status, patient and caregiver attitudes and values regarding oral health, as well as their oral hygiene skills, access to professional dental treatment, establishment of oral hygiene routines, and establishment of regular oral health assessments. It is of paramount importance that we provide the three pillars of preventive oral health care for people with dementia. First, oral health assessment at admission and on a regular basis, at least twice a year. Screening can even be done by trained non-dental professionals. Second, establishment of appropriate oral hygiene routines to be delivered by caregivers on a daily basis. And third, increased access to dental treatment by providing regular dental care and a broad range of dental treatment at nursing facilities, people's homes, and other non-conventional dental settings. Now let's talk about oral health assessment. In many other countries, there are varying levels of regulatory oral assessments in place for long-term care institutions, but very few for home-based care. The International Resident Assessment Instrument has been used in many countries around the world, and it promotes a minimum data set instrument, the MDS-RAI. There are oral nutritional and oral dental sections in the MDS, but research has shown no relationship between MDS oral sections and subsequent dental treatment. It is vital that a meaningful, user-friendly oral health assessment be used not only by dental professionals, but also by non-dental professionals. All oral health assessments should be linked to an oral health care plan. Oral health assessments performed by non-dental professionals are important as they allow monitoring of oral health over time, triage and prioritize dental needs, get a dental visit scheduled when required, provide assessment of oral health when attendance of dental professionals is limited, costly, or refused, evaluate effectiveness of oral hygiene care interventions, and assist with individualized oral hygiene care planning. Two indexes can be used for oral health assessments. The mucosal plaque score index, which basically writes down how much dental plaque is around the mouth, and the index of activities of daily oral hygiene, which is useful for evaluating how much a person can do on their own for oral hygiene and which is more appropriate for patients with mild dementia. The Oral Health Assessment Tool, OHAT, is a validated screening instrument that helps to identify people with major dental issues and provides some level of documentation about oral health status in a very simple way. The Oral Hygiene Care Plan, OHCP, is an instrument that helps caregivers document the best alternatives found to provide oral hygiene routines for their patients and the problems or barriers they have encountered.